Yeah, to say that a countdown is probably yearly updated is somewhat of an understatement. Welcome, one and all! I am the Tau Tactician, and thank you for tuning in. So, basically, I acquired some new games and a new system, the PS3. Why the PS3 instead of the PS4? Well, the PS3 already has a full library of games already, and for the PS4, I'm gonna wait out on it. In any case, this list is exactly like last year's. All these games may not necessarily be from 2014, but I had a blast playing them during the year. Also, this list bumped up from top 10 to top 15 because of pretty much every game on here is worth talking about to some degree. Here we go! Let's start off with a Sonic title! Oh no, 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 no. I made a good decision passing this game up. I'm talking about this one. Why does this game rarely get talked about nowadays? I'm being completely serious here. When I think of 2D Sonic, I always think about the Sonic Rush duology, which I honestly enjoy a little bit more than its classic counterparts. In any case, I should go over what makes this game great. Well, for one, besides the amazing soundtrack composed by Hideki Naganuma, I think it had some great level design and art style, incorporating a unique blend of our favorite 2.5D side-scrolling action with a couple of 3D segments, which are then carried over as the special stages. I rarely have fun playing the special stages, but Sonic Rush mostly averted this with its touch-and-slide 3D action, which I must fully admit was quite fast-paced and an enjoyable challenge more times than not. However, one thing that they did correctly in this game was the introduction of Blaze, along with their overarching character arc, which is by no means a complex plot, but is nonetheless something that I find nothing short of awesome. I mean, in this franchise of mostly underdeveloped characters, it is refreshing to see someone get a little bit of time in the sun aside from the blue blur, which is not at all wasted, might I add. Now if only we could get another official Sonic Rush-esque game. How about more of them 2.5D platformers? So I was on a shopping spree when I came along this cute little gem. Klonoa's remake on the Wii wasn't a game that I think I would be so enticed to play until I actually bought it. When I actually started playing and was getting through it, I couldn't help but be sucked in and enjoy the ride I was going on. As it is yet another 2.5D platformer, it was simple to traverse and easy to use the controls. For Pete's sake, I was able to play this with a simple nunchuck and Wiimote setup when I could have vastly preferred a GameCube controller, except I was playing on the Wii U and the GameCube peripheral had not been announced during the time I was playing this game. The story that takes place in the game actually kind of shocked me when I played it, so the experience was very much enhanced by it, and caused a few tears to jerk at times, although I would say that the simple yet engaging gameplay had trumped the entire thing so far. I also really like the cartoony graphics that this game has. Yes, the game's pretty easy and the graphics kinda support it, being something that is intended for a younger audience, but that is only just an excuse, and a bad one at that for not playing this game. This is an experience that I would recommend for anyone to play, regardless of your initial thoughts. Alright, we sure are racing through this. What's next? We can just make a nice well, this is interesting. Okay, let me just get this out of the way really quickly. I do not hate this game. Far from it. Hell, it is on this list for a reason. I just found it lacking in what makes it a good Mario Kart. I mean, don't get me wrong, I still find this a good game, and the boatload of DLC is out, yet I still have yet to do anything about it right now. In any case, Mario Kart 8 is by far one of the best looking Mario Kart games today. But the thing is, these games aren't that much fun by myself. I mean, I could play the other Mario Kart games I have and go super hardcore on them to try and unlock stuff, but with Mario Kart 8, I feel that playing the game with others is much more enjoyable. Not only that, the game itself, along with other Mario Kart games, aren't alienating in the slightest, so it is easy to get into it with a bunch of people. There is just one problem that irks me with this game, though. 
while it is easy to play and it is a fun game to play with others, I feel that the track design, and I mean the structure, not the art, don't get me wrong, the whole thing looks amazing, but the course design just falls a bit short of being something I would look forward to playing through more than once. Many of the traps are much more difficult in comparison to other Mario Karts. I would give this game a solid 8 out of 10, though. Get it? I think one of the most influential things that had been done during this year has most definitely been Twitch Plays Pokemon. I mean, how many of us tune into this stream just to watch our epic moments and epic fails? I kinda stopped actively watching after Generation 3 though, but I think I can safely say that most people enjoyed watching the stream. I witnessed the defeat of Maxi along with the destruction of Wallace's undefeated streak at WrestleMania- oh wait, wrong thing. I think the entire fandom made this entire thing golden, due to the insanity of the lore that everyone wrote, and it helps relive a few Gen 3 moments. Bless this beautiful stream. And the reason I mentioned Generation 3 is- OH IT ALREADY CONFIRMED! Aw oh man, looking through all of Hoenn has never felt so good. Twitch Plays Omega Ruby was definitely one of the most influential things for me when playing this game, but the capture of Kenya and the defeat of Team IGN. I can't think of too many things wrong with this game, but these guys can. Too easy. Why the hell is Game Freak shipping me and Brendan? We need more story elements. No Mega Evolution for this Pokemon. Too much water! The memes. Yes, it is easy. Pretty darn easy, I might say so myself. But I still had fun. Games necessarily don't have to be so hard or even so lore-driven to make it a good game. I still find it particularly a fun distraction that I could waste my time with. And yes, while some Pokemon could use a Mega Evolution, it doesn't ruin the game entirely, and concerning the amount of shipping in this entry, I think that this game's ending would take the cake for one of the best shipping moments in this list that I did last year. Oh, and Wally's gotten some pretty good character development as well. I can sort of imagine him as the Yuri Lowenthal protagonist type of personality and voice. Just who the hell do you think I am? I'm Simon. I'm not my bro. I'm me! Simon the Digger! Okay, this joke has officially run its course. If you thought you've seen some crazy plot twists, oh man, you have not played this game yet. Ghost Trick is a title that was developed by the creator of the Ace Attorney games, Shu Takami, and this shows here. A cast of all very eccentric characters along with an overarching mystery plot involving this snazzy dead dude, Sissel, in a suit. I guess it really isn't spoilers when the game is literally called Ghost Trick. In any case, while Sissel is a ghost, he has the ability to manipulate objects and move within them like a flame. As a result, he is able to save the life of Lim this redhead over here, who bears a certain resemblance to another redhead in the Ace Attorney games. Must be a coincidence. And so, with Sissel only having amnesia and these newfound abilities, he has until the morning to find out who he is and what exactly is going on before he disappears within that time. And so, in such a case, I will not go over any more of the story due to the fact that going any further would be major spoilers. And that's the thing, this game, in my opinion, can only be played once. When you beat the game, it's over. You can't replay it. Too much dramatic irony. You won't be able to look at it the same way ever again. On the other hand, this is a great puzzle game. You have the ability to manipulate inanimate objects while going back in time if you ever screw up. This object manipulation is some of the greatest fun in this game, due to the creative uses that appear. However, the characters is definitely what sell this game for me. Don't pass this game up, it is an experience you should enjoy. Kirby's back, baby, and he's more friggin' adorable than ever. So, this is basically Return to Dreamland, but with a brand new coat of paint added, and some new copy abilities to play with. 
Also, the control is pretty smooth now that I think about it. Like Return to Dreamland, it has some awesome levels, breathtaking visuals, that glorious Kirby-styled soundtrack, and an array of adversaries that require some kick-ass copy abilities to get through the amazing adventure. I mean, there's some minigame modes too, but... Eh, they're just not for me. Code of Princess Jeez Louise, this was a fun game. It's a spiritual successor to the Garden Heroes game series, which were developed by Treasure. You know, those same guys that made that Sin and Punishment game. Well, at least there were some employees from that company in the development of this game. Anyways, this beat-em-up RPG is, in my opinion, a hidden gem within the 3DS library. It has great characters, hilarious dialogue, and a battle system that would make Guardian Heroes proud. Although I would be saying that if I actually played Guardian Heroes. In any case, I would highly recommend playing this game. Since physical copies are usually nowhere in sight for miles, a digital download would be more recommended. And with the many times that Atlas pulls an eShop sale for this game, I say it's worth the investment. So, I decide that since I had this giant PS3 lying around, I might try and get some games for it. One series in particular that caught my eye was the Uncharted series. So, why not and play Uncharted? 2. I don't remember the last time I enjoyed a third person shooter game such as this. Tons of collectibles, a story with twists and turns that make you hold onto your heads, and lots of the glorious Nolan North. Literally, Nathan Drake's one liners and quips just make me love this game. <laughs> Hey, check it out. Marco. Really? Come on. No. Marco. Oh, no. Fish out of water. You are so unprofessional. Ah, that's right, you bastards. We got you now. Oh, crap. Don't you assholes see the helicopter? I've got enough trouble already. I can't wait to play the rest of the Uncharted series and experience more of the thrill-seeking, daredevilish, and high-risk wall-climbing scenarios that I will encounter with each one. Well, except for Uncharted 4. Can't play that if I don't have the PS4. I started playing a little thing called Devil May Cry. Flashy cutscenes, and somewhat difficult, but it is still fun. However, even though I enjoyed that game very much, it can't top this one. Did you miss me? Oh boy, this game. This freaking game. Such a fantastic game. Too bad it didn't win Game of the Year, but nonetheless, it is still very fun. The various weapons from the first game are all back in a different way, but there are just so many new weapons that are available that I just love them all. I mean, personally, I use the sword weapons available. It is a hack and slash game for a reason. The difficulty is also turned down a bit, but it doesn't ruin the original Bayonetta experience. Intense action and huge bosses with gigantic attacks on each one, and you get to bring them all down. Also, the Lumen Sage is by far my favorite character. And to think, there's still one more game by Platinum Games on here. Shit. Early 2014 for America, as they said. August 29th, it came! My god, this was an anticipated release. Crossover the year this game was hyped up to be. The greatness of Professor Layden paired up with the tenacity of Phoenix Wright? What could possibly top that? Well, perhaps some other kinds of crossovers, but let me have my moment here. Since Capcom had took two whole years to bring this overseas, you can tell that a lot of people were dedicated to having this game. And then it took another four or five months to bring it to the Americas, with practically no localization differences between the two versions. Good job, Level 5 slash Capcom. Add some spectacular visuals, animated cutscenes, and a mind-blowing orchestral soundtrack, and you have one hell of a game. And I know what you're all thinking. The story. Well, I'm gonna pass it with one reason, and one reason alone. Appeals to pathos, son. Hello, 
Hyrule Warriors! This game is one hell of a Zelda fan service pack. I mean, obscure references here and there aside, it also has some pretty badass incarnations of various Zelda characters. The story's not the greatest, but then again, this is a Nintendo game, excuse plots are acceptable. Dynasty Warriors gameplay of self-indulgence where I can eliminate armies within minutes? Yeah, I'll take it. DLC? Give me all of it! A.G. Onuma compared this game to the Avengers, and I can kinda see it. And if anyone says that this game is too easy, allow me to refute that with one singular claim. ADVENTURE MODE IS FREAKING HELL! Now, here is the game that was the whole reason why I bought a PS3 in the first place. Oh my freaking word, Platinum Games, you guys really outdid yourselves. This game is already carving itself a nice niche for itself within the Metal Gear universe. Yeah, it's not still nice. More action-y and slicing things up like tomatoes, but hey, that's not a bad thing, right? Platinum Games has had a reputation for making some crazy awesome scenarios, so applying that to Metal Gear isn't too difficult, considering it has had its own crazy awesome moments too. And Raiden is the perfect and acceptable target to use these kind of scenarios on, all things considered. He's a friggin' cyborg ninja. I can't really think of too many things wrong with this game where they are overshadowed by the good. And since we're here... Nano Machine Son! Was this outcome necessary? No. Time to talk about the best Square Enix game ever published this year. Yeah, not too much interest in those, except for Kingdom Hearts, but didn't play Kingdom Hearts. So, logic dictates... Bravely default. I honestly can remember a JRPG where I actually had to work and get the things that I wanted in it while exploring vast open dungeons like this. I mean, there's Pokemon, but like I said, it was too easy, so the experience kinda went by fast. On the other hand, this game was anything but fast. In fact, it is incredibly long. But that doesn't mean a damn thing, as I mostly had fun. I say mostly because some things still frustrate the hell out of me, but nonetheless! I kinda talked about one of my favorite classes in the last countdown I made, and talked about the gameplay and story briefly there as well. And yes, story could use some tweaks, but damn me if I have a high tolerance for bullcrap in video games. Can't wait for Bravely Second. Atlas, stop making me sell my soul to your games, goddammit! It's kinda sad when JRPGs like this get either no attention or too much hate because it is similar to Persona. No seriously, take any modern day JRPG that has either relationship values or has been released on the PS Vita and see how many people compare it to Persona. Myself included, I had even compared it to Persona in a video beforehand. But just because it is similar to another product doesn't mean it's automatically bad. I mean, I think the entire concept of the game intrigues me so well that I can play it. A game where you can build a harem, make children, get no repercussions, and have them fight alongside you in what essentially would be a Persona game with Fire Emblem Awakening child-making mechanics hybrid. Bitch, please, take my money and give me my collector's edition. And just having all these children running around and kicking ass and taking names is also cute. No joke, I seriously think this is one of the most creative games out there, even if the combat isn't that good. Which I think is probably one of its low points. I love this game. I really do. But for the love of the Star God, this game's curve of difficulty is staggering. You know how Atlas said that they enjoy watching gamers suffer? Well, even if they are the publishers, this game spews out difficulty deep end. The first four or five dungeons are, in my honest opinion, <laughs> fairly easy, although that was kind of accidental, since I was insistent on having everyone at the same level. But as the dungeons got longer and longer, they also became incredibly more difficult, with more enemies and them getting higher and higher amounts of HP. Thank god I was item farming and rarely needs a heal during those other dungeons. Oh yeah, and the combat is also incredibly simple, but some bosses keep you on your toes. Even though it may look like a typical dating sim with so much Japanese fan service plaster over it, it is still a relatively fun game, and I enjoy it so, so much. This game genuinely has me interested in its prequel as well, and perhaps is RPG of the year for me. 
Yet, there's still one game that can trump it all for me. There were many different fighting games that came out this year, but two more popular ones that came out were Blaze Blue, Chrono Phantasma, and Persona 4 Arena Ultimate. So, which one is the better one? Well, why don't we... Settle it in SMASH! Like it had to be anything else, Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS. So many improvements overall that I thought were necessary, such as the removal of tripping, Metaconite's balancing, and the somewhat removal of stage hazards. Seriously, Omega Forms saves so much of a headache. In any case, I'm not disappointed, unlike most people are so, and I'm very glad to declare that Smash 4 is the best game I've played all year. I'm the Tao Tactician, and I can't wait to see you guys on Valentine's Day.